Um, so today we're going to um, talk about a number of issues related to allergen management and um, we'll start off by um, talking a little bit about who we are at Dairy Food Safety and our key functions. We'll consider some of the regulatory obligations of manufacturers as well as some food industry guidance and practice, practices around allergen management. Ian will discuss um, what an allergen management program is and what the various elements of that might be um, and how that would, might fit into a, a manufacturer's um, food safety program. We'll also look at what a dairy food safety manager is reviewing at, at, at audit um, when they're doing their regulatory audits um, and may decide to focus on um, allergen management and some of the typical non-conformances or corrective actions for allergens that they might observe during those audits. And then we'll finish up with looking at some recalls and some case studies um, where we see some failures in those allergen managements. So Dairy Food Safety Victoria, those uh, Victorian dairy food manufacturers will well know well who we are. For those others around the country, um, we are the dairy regulator in Victoria. We license all dairy businesses in Victor that are operating in Victoria. This includes farms, manufacturers, distributors and carriers, right up to delivery of final product to the retail store. Our food safety managers or our auditors conduct twice yearly audits of dairy manufacturers um, and this is to monitor compliance with the approved food safety programs and other regulatory requirements. And during that audit they'll assess the adequacy of the program so they'll look at whether it's still um, relevant to the operations at the plant as, and also monitor the compliance to the program. So make sure that um, the uh, uh, food safety, that the, what what's the business says they will be doing in their food safety program is actually being done. Um, and also we at Dairy Food Safety provide technical advice and support to our licensees to help them meet their dairy food regulatory obligations. Um, and that's where Ian and I and our colleagues in the in science and industry support team fit into the picture. So what are allergens? Allergens? usually proteins, not always, that can cause an immune response in sensitive individuals. And we need to emphasise the difference between an allergy and an intolerance. So allergic reactions um, are based on an immunolo immunological response, unlike a tolerance, which may be just a sensitivity. Um, allergic reactions are much more severe than insensitivities and can result in anaphylaxis which is a swelling of the airways. It can cause difficulty breathing and ultimately cardiovascular system, symptoms. Um, allergies can be fatal. So it's a serious food safety hazard. And as manufacturers, it's something that we really need to take seriously. So what are the regulatory requirements of dairy manufacturers in regards to allergens in foods? So the Food Standards Code specifies the allergens that are subject to mad mandatory labeling requirements. And in Victoria, the legislation that requires businesses to comply with the Food Standards Code of the Dairy Act 2000 and the Food Act 90, 1984. Other states will have similar legislation requiring businesses to comply with the Food Standards Code. Um, sections of the Food Act also may apply in the context of allergens and there's a couple of sections there that may be used in regards to um, uh, allergens, allergen issues. Um, manufacturers who are export registered also need to comply with the export control orders, um, specifically around trade descriptions in, in relation to allergens. So it's really important also that manufacturers understand and comply with the allergen labelling requirements of the importing countries. So if you're in, uh, exporting product to another country, you need to understand what their labelling requirements are in regards to allergens. And um, there are a wide range of allergens in, um, or differences in priority allergens in various countries. So you need to really understand what needs to be labelled depending on the country that it's exported to. So what are the allergens of concern to us in, as dairy manufacturers? Um, as I've mentioned, the Food Standards Code um, names all these allergens. There's currently 11. Um, lupins has just recently, recently been added in the last month or so. Um, 
So all of these allergens must be declared on the packaging of a finished product if they are present as ingredients or ingredients of compound ingredients, or if they're additives or processing aids or ingredients or components of these. So even if it's an ingredient of an ingredient of an ingredient, it must be declared on the labelling of the finished product. So at first glance, many of these allergens may not seem important to dairy manufacturers. Um, but we need to keep in mind that sometimes they can be present in some ingredients. Um, for example, lysozyme, which is used in some cheese, is derived from egg. Lecithin from soy can be used as, a, as an emulsifier in many dairy products. Um, some dip manufacturers may include salmon or trout or a crustacea in their dips. Sesame seeds are used in tahini, which is also used in a lot of dips. Um, sulfites may be present in some fruits that are added to yogurt or cheese. So sometimes these allergens can be hidden in amongst other ingredients. Um, this highlights the importance of understanding the origin of your ingredients. And just as an aside, to help with this, the Allergen Bureau has published a document called Unexpected Allergens in Foods, which lists allergens that can be present in various ingredients. Um, and if you look at that document, you can see that um, there's quite a lot of uh, various ingredients that um, may contain allergens that you wouldn't expect based on the name of that particular ingredient. The other thing about these particular allergens um, that are listed in the Food Standards Code is they must always be present on a label irrespective of how much is present. So if they're just an ingredient of an ingredient of ingredient, it doesn't matter what levels they are present in the food, they must be on the label. So we've talked about, oh, change slide. We've talked about the regulations relating to the labeling of products in which present allergens are present as ingredients. But there's also some guidelines that have been developed at, by industry and that are aimed at providing consistency in allergen labelling, particularly around labelling in foods in which allergens may be present through incidental cross contact, so not intentionally added to product. So the Australian Food and Grocery Council has released a, a publication called um, Food Industry Guide to Allergen Management and Labelling. Um, and some of the recommended, <coughs> excuse me, labelling formats in that include um, ensuring that allergens are labelled in, uh, are in, uh, in bold in the ingredient statement so that it's easy for allergic consumers to pick these out. They also recommend using a separate allergen summary statement, which may or may not be in bold, uh, and particularly the inclusion of a precautionary statement. And this is um, what we all know as a may contain statement. Um, and they specify that it needs to be used in um, conjunction with a risk assessment, um, such as the vital tool. Um, this document also has some really useful information about allergen management um, in the food industry in general and the various elements of an allergen management program. Um, the Allergen Bureau also provides a large amount of information around allergen management. They've, they developed and administered the VITAL tool, which I mentioned a little earlier. Um, this is a tool that was developed to facilitate more accurate and consistent communication around the unintentional presence of allergens in food. Um, this is particularly important for allergic consumers because while they need to know if allergens might be present in their food, it's also not helpful to them if a blanket precautionary statement is used when it's not necessary. So if there's a very low risk, extremely low risk of that product, of that analogen being in that product, it's not helpful for them to have um, that statement on there and it really reduces their food choices. So I'll hand over to Ian now, who's going to talk in a little bit more detail about um, allergen management programs. Okay, so we're on air. <laughs> okay, so let's look a little bit more specifically and how do you actually comply with uh, your labelling obligations and regulations and uh, through an allergen management program. Um, so how is it that uh, manufacturers manage, uh, manage an allergens on their site to ensure products are labelled accurately uh, in regards to the presence of allergens? So firstly, you've got to understand what the allergens are and those that, uh, those that were listed as Gabby mentioned. Uh, and you also need to be aware of you know, what allergens are on site for the potential for allergens being in your products. Um, also, um, undeclared allergens in product can come from a number of sources. So things like uh, raw material control failures, um, cross contact, 
or even labeling failures. So the allergen management program is designed to control these possible clauses. Um, and then of course, most importantly, is that the information you're trying to provide is how uh, you can protect allergic consumers and also uh, equally for you is um, how you can protect your brand. So where you have got allergens on site, uh, you certainly will have a, a HACCP plan, of course, already uh, that you would be familiar with. Uh, and allergens should be considered as part of your um, food safety risk and part of that food safety program. Uh, it will be very much site dependent. Um, so for example, uh, it'll be quite unique. Each site will be producing different products. Uh, for example, cheddar cheese would be quite different to one producing a large number of different flavors such as ice creams or dips, for example. Um, and of course, the other thing that you need to do is to review this uh, constantly and probably update that um, periodically. So when we have a look at the elements of an, an allergen management program, it'll vary from something quite simple or can be quite complex, um, as we mentioned, depending on the products that you're making. And here's a list there of uh, what we will be, what you should be considering, and we're going to have a look at those in a little bit more detail now. So um, when allergens are intentionally added, um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but when you look at the risk of unintentional presence of allergens in products, um, a risk assessment is what may be warranted. So in regards to a risk assessment, um, again, it's uh, looking at the presence of undeclared allergens and that can be a very serious issue, uh, a food safety issue, excuse me. Uh, again, this is, will be a hazard based approach and where, for example, where you're evaluating the risk of an introduction of an allergen, um, identifying the critical points at which allergens could be introduced and monitoring of these in a systematic approach. Um, as I say, you'll be familiar with that approach under your normal HACCP program. Uh, and of course, it should be documented and be effective. Uh, and it suggests that you would have a multifunctional team and that's um, gathering the people who have the knowledge that can uh, assist in getting the right information. And it also needs to be um, relevant to the allergens of concern. So in other words, are they processed on the same line? Are they processed on adjacent lines? What time are they processed? Um, you know, what is the cleaning regime? What has occurred before or after the use of the allergen? Um, and developing a site map has, uh, is a very useful strategy um, to identify high risk areas. And we've seen uh, examples of where this has been done effectively at a lot of our uh, licensees. And you not, uh, need to identify uh, cross contact opportunities. So um, having done a risk assessment will uh, lead you on where you should go uh, with labeling. Um, and when we talk about labeling uh, and we mentioned about um, the precautionary allergen labelling um, or PAL it, uh, and the statements uh, Gabby mentioned before uh, can be either a help or a hindrance to consumers and they really want to know what's the real level of risk and the vital tool, the voluntary incidental trace allergen labelling tool is uh, very useful for that. So if we move on to you know what are your vendor assurance or suppliers uh, and your raw material management aspects. Um, the question you need to ask is that certainly needs to be documented in your program. So supplier assurance and has been emphasized from um, earlier seminars, which we've held on, um, on allergens in the past and, and quotes like, um, you know, you need to have trust in your suppliers or they're seen as an extension of your business. Um, you know, what is the procedure if a new supplier, for example, um, regarding allergens for an, an emergency change or you know, do your inf uh, supplies inform you of new formulations or ingredients? You know, how reliable are they and, and can you trust them to advise you? Um, the um, product information form, the PIF, um, it's a useful source of information, but you need to question that and actually uh, you know, give it the sense test, I guess is what we would call it. You know, does it look logical to you? Is it believable? So what is the level of detail that's being provided and, and can you be confident that it's going to be accurate? Don't take it for granted that uh, what is written may necessarily be true. And so, as I mentioned, uh, you know, do the suppliers advise you when they change sources? You know, how do you find this out? And we'll see some examples of this uh, in, in the case studies a little bit later, later on. 
Um, and there is a book um, which is quite useful in determining the, uh, the it's called the uh, Unexpected Allergens in Food and it's put out by the Allergen Bureau and it uh, can help as a double check for allergen decorations um, and help you identify ingredients in which allergens um, can be present. So with regards to uh, raw material storage, it's really a case of getting the basics right. You know, are they dedicated areas for allergenic raw materials, which reduce the risk of cross-contamination uh, cross or inadvertent use? So in other words, storing the, um, the allergens on the, the uh, lower levels, for example, so they can't spill. So we have a look at um, validation and verification of cleaning. Obviously, this is uh, vital. You know, how do you, how do you actually validate cleaning? In other words, how do you demonstrate the procedures used are effective in removing residues and controlling um, cross-contamination? And as Gabby mentioned, you've got to remember that allergens are mainly proteins, so they will denature um, under some processes, particularly with heat. Uh, and a lot of them might be easy to clean off equipment, and they can be also fatty as well as proteinaceous and uh, quite sticky, particularly after heating. In some cases, they may take a couple of washes to actually clean them off. Um, so I'd also uh, suggest that you don't uh, forget to consider your COP in your water as a potential for um, COP water contamination. Um, and again, you know, if we're looking at uh, a wet wash versus dry wash, milk powders would be completely different. For example, they might use, um, you know, air flush or sugar flush or, you know, a combination of brushing and milk powder flushing or, or whatever. So it will be different between the types of products that you're using or manufacturing. So, you know, what is considered effective validation? Um, it's been suggested that 30 samples spread along a processing line would be adequate and making sure that, uh, and of course, making sure that the cleanings remove the allergens. So in other words, you don't swab in the same spot um, before and after cleaning because you won't get the <laughs> correct result. Um, choice of testing method. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit more detail later on, um, but basically just to um, emphasize here that it is appropriate to make sure that you get the appropriate matrix and the right um, test kit that's going to work for you for your products. So the segregation of your, uh, or the scheduling of your production, um, obviously you need to keep um, allergens segregated and degree, um, well, to the degree that's possible and practicable. Um, they need to be dedicated and easily identifiable. And, and all of these, for example, containers, bins, pallets, um, allergen containing products um, can be color coded for, as an example. You need to restrict crossover staff between allergenic and non-allergenic production lines and um, where possible segregate production areas with or without allergens. Um, you need to be careful with rework. So in other words, consider labeling your allergen containing materials, especially work in progress um, and identify you know, what products um, they can and they can't be used in. Uh, equipment and utensils, um, again, clearly identifiable and um, segregated. And in regards to the scheduling of um, allergens and non-allergenic um, products, um, you need to try and reduce the risk of cross contact um, and schedule cl cleaning immediately after those. And dedicated cleaning equipment is also recommended um, again, to, to minimise cross-contamination cross from allergens. And also um, suggest that you consider near dust and airflow and particulates and those sort of things as well. So staff training, um, the importance of this, I don't think can be under-emphasised. Under and I guess the analogy is, you know, that a chain's only as strong as the weakest link. And it's quite often what we see, all the work, the good work can be um, undone by simple, er simple errors. And uh, so you need to question what training is delivered and is it going to be adequate? And you know, consider here, um, you know, do your staff actually understand what an, an allergen management program is? You know, do they understand how cross contact or other incidents can occur? Um, and you can use examples in how that's worked or it hasn't worked. Um, do they understand the implications or the consequences of an incident? Um, both from a consumer and also from your business perspective. And, and they need to know the reasons why 
um, these things are important. So the, obviously the training needs to be um, ongoing and we'd suggest at least an annual refresher is, is, is um, a minimum. But um, a food safety culture here we mentioned, and again, we've seen from the um, seminars we've had that how important this and effective it can be. So in other words, examples of this would be, you know, encouraging and rewarding and empowering staff to identify um, possible causes and issues and speak up and, um, you know, listen to, to what they have to say, because often your employees are best placed to identify these sort of issues and they actually know um, what goes on in the real world. So moving on to labelling, um, you know, what, what product, what controls do you actually have in place to ensure the product is labelled correctly? Um, and you know, just to reiterate, again, it may be the basics, but if it's used as an ingredient, additive or processing aid, um, it must be on the label. And the other thing, as I say, to also consider, you know, what's going to be actually helpful to um, allergic consumers. So, you know, who actually, what label checks do you, do you um, undertake and who does that and how reliable are they? And maybe you might even use um, automated methods that can um, help you and are perhaps a little bit more reliable. Um, does the label um, reflect product formulation changes, new ingredients, new, in supply, new suppliers, etc.? cetera? Um, changing of labels for new products, you know, in, and um, when that occurs, you need to ensure that old labels are, disc are discarded. So it's really a case of getting the basics right. So verification. Um, verification is basically a schedule for testing a product to confirm that the allergen management program is working. Um, similar to the way that your regular micro testing um, is a verification check. So, you know, how many and how often do you need to do those checks? Well, that's gonna be dependent on the risk that you have for your particular site um, and the allergen types, the number of allergens, except, et cetera. So it's not simple black and white that uh, we could get detail here, but uh, something that you would need to work out for yourselves. But uh, it certainly would be a, uh, need to be an ongoing program. Okay, thank you, Ian. So, as I've mentioned earlier, a dairy food safety food safety manager will conduct a regulatory audit of a um, Victorian dairy business um, twice a year. Um, so, when a food safety manager is auditing your business, um, they may choose to focus on allergen management at that particular particular audit and look at your allergen management um, practices and controls. So, what are they going to be looking for? when they do this particular audit. They're going to be looking at whether the food safety program adequately addresses the appropriate aspects of allergen management. So Ian's talked about some of the controls you may have in place as part of your allergen management program. So they'll look at whether they consider those to be adequate for your site, considering the allergens you have on site and the practices and operations you have. They'll also be looking at whether the rec at for, or looking for records that relate to the relevant elements of the allergen management program to demonstrate that these controls are in place and they're working and being monitored. They'll also look at things like, you know, have you considered what allergens, what ingredients contain allergens, what products contain allergens? Um, have you looked, um, created an allergen map to assist the risk of various areas of the plant that are high risk for allergen cross contact? Have you created a, sh a scheduling or allergen matrix to reduce the risk of con cross contact between products which contain allergens and those that don't? Um, and, sh and, and you need, have you ensured that these are all documented and, and recorded? They'll also be looking at whether you may have done a risk assessment and assess the risk of each of these things, which would then um, help you with your allergen um, mapping and um, matrix. So if, if they do find deficiencies in any of these areas in relation to allergen management, the food safety manager may then issue a corrective action request. So this graph um, looks at the allergen related cars that have been issued by food safety managers as a result of failures in um, allergen management. And this is over the past three years. So we can see the bulk of allergen related corrective action requests um, 
have been raised at ice cream powder and cheese plants. Um, so by far the majority is ice cream. Um, and this very much is reflective of the type of products that are made by an ice cream manufacturer. Generally speaking, they have a high number of products with a large number of different flavours, lots of different inclusions, and a high number of ingredients, all of which may or may not contain allergens. And this is also something that other sectors may want to keep in mind as well. Dip manufacturers, yogurt manufacturers, who may also um, have large number of ingredients coming into their plants, which they need to keep a track of um, and need to be on top of with their risk assessment and allergen matrices. There was also a high number of uh, non-conformances in powder plants. Um, generally, this was related to cleaning verification deficiencies. So for example, they haven't demonstrated that the cleaning removes, removes allergens within those plants. And they're looking at allergens such as things like um, emulsifiers and anti-caking agents um, and some of those ingredients that may have allergens present. So if we look more closely at some of these corrective action requests that have been raised by our food safety managers, this graph looks at the section of the food safety program that the car was raised under. So you can see by far the majority were considered um, under the HACCP category, if you like. Um, and in this case, it's where, most manu where manufacturers have failed to appro appropriately assess allergens within their processing. So they haven't done um, as allergen assessments, they haven't done risk assessments, they, all, they may not have kept these up to date and they may not reflect their current processes and variants. For example, um, if a new product is, um, start, has been manufactured that hasn't been manufactured, this hasn't been included or there hasn't been a risk assessment undertaken on this. Um, the labelling um, had the highest number of critical non-conformances. Um, these would generally relate to deficiencies in declaring allergens on the finished product, um, including listing allergens from compound ingredients, which is something that's relatively common. Um, if these products were in market, um, that would result in a recall due to the presence of undeclared allergens in foods, um, hence the critical nature of the corrective action. Operational practices, um, cars raised under this heading would um, be around deficiencies in storage and identification of allergens on site. So looking a little more closely at the root causes behind some of these um, corrective actions, um, this is some data that was undertaken by our operations department. Um, we can see that the root causes for non-conformances um, confirms that uh, aller deficient allerg allergen risk assessment. So um, risk assessment, allergen matrix, um, fairly similar sort of, um, similar sort of um, controls that a plant might have in place. Um, and by far, we see a lot of um, failures to keep these up to date. For example, new products coming in or old products going out and making sure that um, these risk assessments are kept up to date. Um, verification and validation of cleaning practices is also a fairly common reason for corrective actions uh, or faults that our, our food safety managers identify on site. And that's where manufacturers may fail to demonstrate that cleaning effectively removes allergens. Um, this is an interesting graph which just shows the number of corrective actions that have been raised by our food safety managers over the past four or five years. Um, and very much reflects, um, I think, the increasing awareness amongst particularly auditors and regulators, but also amongst consumers um, of the importance of allergens in food and the importance of um, being able to control and ensuring that products are labelled um, accurately. Okay, so we've talked about some um, corrective actions or some deficiencies that have been highlighted by our food safety managers on site. Um, and this really does show that things can and go wrong on a reasonably frequent basis. Um, ultimately, in the worst case scenario, some of these failures in allergen controls on site may result in um, product recalls. Uh, this is some Fazan's data on food recalls in Australia over the last nine years or so. Um, so we can see that in 2016, 46% or almost half of recalls were due to the presence of, or were due to allergens or the presence of undeclared allergens in food. 
Um, and again, this is something that's, the number has been steadily growing over the past years, as you can see quite clearly from this table. And this is also reflected in the previous slide where we've seen an increase in the number of corrective actions. So all this data really does suggest that there's still a lot of work to do in the area of allergen management. Um, just as a little aside, this is another, this is some more data from Fazans, um, looking at the type of allergens that were responsible for the recalls during the period. So this is over a large period from 2007 to 2016. Um, and interestingly, dairy is the allergen that's most commonly, um, the mo that's the most common cause of an undeclared allergen food recall. Keeping in mind, this isn't actually a dairy product. This is the presence of milk proteins in products in which it shouldn't be present. But it's also something that we need to keep in mind as dairy manufacturers if we are also producing non-dairy products. So while we, might, we have obviously a lot of milk protein on site, if we're producing products that are dairy free, we need to ensure that our cleaning valid, validations and all our allergen controls um, are up to date and effective. Um, so now we're just going to have a look at a few case studies um, and examples of where things have gone wrong. And these are all examples that our food safety managers have identified during audit um, or have been notified to us as a regulator. In this case, a manufacturer of a gelato was making a Tim Tam gelato. On the left, we can see um, the, ing the ingredient that went into that product. Um, clearly, the label states that it contains wheat, barley, milk, eggs, sulfites and soy, and it had a may contain statement with tree nuts, peanuts, sesame and gluten. However, on the right, the finished product label was only, only declared milk and sulfites as allergens and um, with a may contain tracement, traces of tree nuts. So you can see that they had not at any point declared wheat, egg or soy in that product. As a result of this oversight, um, there was a trade level recall undertaken, or with, sorry, a trade level withdrawal, sorry. Um, the manufacturer was issued with a critical non-conformance. Um, this resulted in multiple on-site um, car closeout audits and unannounced audits and was quite an expensive exercise for this manufacturer. Um, the second case study is an example of uh, failure in label checking. Um, this was a consumer complaint that was referred to the Department of Health and Human Services and then subsequently on to us for investi investigation. You can see on the left, the finished product has an egg-free claim on the front of the pack. But when you look at the rear of the pack, under the ingredients label, egg white is clearly, <laughs> clearly listed there. Um, and it was considered that given the risk that susceptible persons might susceptible people might be attracted to the egg-free claim on the front and not then check the ingredients label. Um, this also resulted in a recall of uh, 690 units of this particular product. Um, another example of um, failing to check ingredient labels, um, this was a small ice cream manufacturer. They used milk powder um, as an ingredient in all their products. We can see from the picture on the screen that that contained an emulsifier derived from soy. However, none of the product had soy label, the final product, finished product had soy present on the label. Again, uh, a person who was allergic to soy would have looked at the ingredient of that finished product and considered it safe to eat. This resulted in a trade level recall. Um, all categories of finished product were tested for soy um, and a, a change in their operational procedures um, and the manufacturer now ensures that all, so all milk powder is, um, they source milk powder that's free from soy. Um, this is another case I mentioned earlier about lysozyme being present in some types of cheese. Um, this is a case of the manufacturer failing to check labels or um, using an alternative supplier and not checking whether the ingredients were the same as their um, previous supplier. Um, a routine audit identified um, that um, there was lysozyme present in the um, ingredient that went into a that was blended with another product. Um, this was declared on the ingredient label and it was declared um, on the uh, PIF form, the product specification form. Um, there was a failure by the manufacturer to review that document documentation appropriately 
appropriately and ensure that um, the finished product label also declared that there was product uh, there, there was egg in the final product. This resulted in a consumer level recall um, and changes to the incoming product um, specifications and procedures. I'm now going to finish up with a good example. Um, this is an example of a dairy business which was proactive in its approach to precautionary labelling. Um, initially, um, this was a manufacturer that pr produced a wide range of different products with different flavours and inclusions, um, and all product produced on that site was labelled as may contain. Um, the retailer customer for that manufacturer recommended that they undertake a vital assessment and look more closely at their allergen practices. So a vital training was undertaken by their QA manager and went on to do, who went on to do a vital assessment on all the products. And there was quite a number of products, it was a big job and they went line by line and did a, an assessment of um, the entire um, uh, uh, range of, of products that they produced. As a result, they developed an allergen matrix, um, which then were used for scheduling and production. Um, but more importantly, they undertook a very large project to, um, to look at, to do some cleaning validation. So they looked at all their lines and completely dismantled the filler lines and did some swabbing. And so they swabbed after one wash, two washes and three washes. And they determined that for some of their allergens, it took two washes to remove um, all traces of that particular allergen from the line. This was then built into their allergen matrix and production schedule. And so any equipment that was used for any product produced after those certain products um, needed to have two washes before a new product was, was um, put through the line. They also audited um, high risk suppliers. So they looked at the suppliers and any suppliers who had allergens present on site were subjected to an audit by this manufacturer. And this helped them, again, gave them confidence that those manufacturers um, were appropriately labelling and controlling allergens on their site. Um, they had uh, instigated a, a comprehensive staff training program. Um, so all staff were trained on allergens and this was refreshed annually. They also looked at um, modifying their ingredient storage practices. They created a specific room for allergens, um, pallet space for large quantities and had, had a segregated room in the cooler to ensure that all allergens were well segregated from um, non-allergen containing um, ingredients. All equipment is colour coded, so any equipment used on um, any work in progress or um, finished product or ingredients that contained allergen was colour coded appropriately and staff were trained to know that what the colours, what that any coloured equipment was not to be used on um, products with no allergens present. So as a result of this review that the, um, this particular manufacturer did and using the vital tool and doing their risk assessments and their cleaning validations, the outcome was that they no longer needed to use a may contain statement for allerg all allergens um, and subsequently all their product is that now only has a may contain statement for tree nuts and that's due to the particulate nature of those, um, that particular allergen. Um, and this outcome is also much more helpful for allergic consumers because they can be confident when they um, look at this product that it is safe for them to eat um, and they can, rather than just look, being able to look at that product, seeing a may contain statement and considering that they can't have that product. Um, so I'll briefly hand over now to Ian who will talk about some testing methods and wind up the webinar. Thank you. Okay, so just having a, a quick look at this, um, it is important to understand that the methods being used and the factors that can influence the um, ability to accurately detect allergens. So bearing that in mind, <coughs> there are a couple of options that uh, are available for you for testing. Uh, and some can be used in-house if you have that uh, capability and uh, know-how and inclination, uh, or alternatively you um, might rely on a external commercial laboratory. <clears throat> so the methods that, you, that are available, lateral flow is a relatively simple dipstick uh, with a color change methodology. It is uh, semi-quantitative, but uh, bear in mind it is less sensitive than other methodologies, um, but it still may be appropriate for cleaning validation. 
Uh, when we're looking at, at ELISA tests, um, these require a little bit more lab equipment and, and perhaps um, know-how and expertise. They can also be used in-house and, and they're also used by um, external commercial labs too. So uh, it is, although it's a, a qualitative test, in other words, it's detecting presence or absence, um, it is actually more sensitive than the lateral flow, lateral flow uh, methods. So both um, ELISA and lateral flow methods rely on uh, the antibody binding to the site of um, an allergenic protein. And so it's very important to note that um, the results can actually be affected by the food matrix. In other words, the type of product or the structure of that product, um, and also the um, processing that uh, your product may have undertaken. In other words, some um, might've been heated or to, um, to perhaps cause some sort of denaturation. So you need to work closely with either your um, kit supplier or your testing lab or both to ensure that you're actually going to get uh, the, not necessarily the results that you want, but uh, certainly the interpretation of the results that, that uh, you're expecting. Uh, and, and by doing that, uh, you need to explain clearly to that um, lab, you know, what actually you're wanting to prove with that testing. So there is a third method is, that is available. It's um, PCR. It is, a, again, it's a, a qualitative presence or absence test, but it's um, far more sensitive than the above two. Uh, and it's generally a procedure that's restricted to commercial labs. Um, it only detects DNA. So the present actually, the protein actually may be present, but uh, not the DNA. So there are possibilities you can get um, false negatives through that um, fact. But um, in a nutshell, you need to validate your testing methods to, pro um, to prove that it works and that it can detect allergens of concern in the products that you're making. Um, so in wrapping that up, you know, we, we know that consumers are becoming increasingly more aware and vigilant of allergens. And uh, I imagine that your customers uh, will be doing so as well. So we've looked at what you as manufacturers should be considering, but from a DFSB perspective, um, we're having an ongoing focus on allergen management uh, through audits. And uh, we're also, uh, we'll be um, targeting having targeted information available and communicating with uh, the higher risk industry segments, for example, the ice cream manufacturers, um, powder cheese, yogurt, and also dip manufacturers as well. And so finally, uh, just as, as uh, um, some resources, which you probably find available, most of these you'll find that there's some good references and also uh, useful links from our website, the DFSV website. Uh, and in particular, um, you might or might not be aware that we've had allergen seminar videos, um, which are now available from, um, uh, that um, certainly it is, uh, we're industry focused and that information is still um, quite current as well. Bureau suggests that you know you would wanting to, you'd be wanting to look at um, you know thirty so obviously it's going to depend on the size of the line and, and the nature of the processing line that that you are looking at, but um, you would need to sort of do the multiple sites and you would need to do. Um, at least three times, and you'd need to focus on the hard to clean areas to, to demonstrate that the entire line has been clear, cleaned of um, and cleared of allergens. Okay, uh, if I just add to that, um, certainly the, the variation, I guess, it, and as I mentioned in the talk, that you know it is going to be site specific as to you know what you're actually going to perhaps need to do, uh, and it, as there's quite a, a broad range, and as Gabby mentioned, um, you know. Um, it's not just cut and dried or easy to put in a box. Um, you almost need to look at your individual situation and determine that yourself. Does the ELISA test target certain allergens? Okay, um, yes, there are um, various suppliers of ELISA allergen test kits um, and generally speaking, the allergen, the ELISA test kits are specific for certain allergens. So um, depending on what allergen you want to test for, you can usually get an ELISA kit to test for that allergen. Mm -hmm. And there's a number of different um, lab suppliers out there who, who can supply those. Um, are there any guidelines on frequency of product testing? No. 
in a, nutsh <laughs> <laughs> in a nutshell, no, Deborah Shri, unfortunately, it, and as I say, it's going to be a case by case basis because it's just such a broad um, spectrum of, of um, various sizes, capabilities, um, product types. So you would really just have to individually look at what your own circumstances are and perhaps make your own judgment on that and maybe even talk to your um, food safety manager when when they're doing orders as well but uh, no there's no specific guideline that you can follow for that unfortunately mm -hmm.